In this second video of photosynthesis, we're going to examine the specifics of the light dependent reactions. In the previous video, we looked at some different factors that can influence the rate of photosynthesis, as well as some limiting factors to photosynthesis. And in this video, we're going to actually get into the nuts and bolts of how photosynthesis is occurring. And in this particular video, we'll look at the light dependent reactions, meaning that light is necessary in order for these reactions to occur. And so in this diagram, that's this portion of this of the overall process of photosynthesis. And so in this portion, lights, water will be used to produce a waste product of oxygen, O2, ATP, and NADPH, which will then be used in the independent reactions that we'll see in the next video. The light dependent reactions are all dependent on light. Obviously, that makes sense. They, play, they take place in the thylakoid of the chloroplast. So that's where they're taking place. And within the thylakoid, there are chlorophyll molecules that are grouped together um, into something called a photosystem. And so this is a photosystem here, and this is actually called photosystem 2. And the reason why this first one is called photosystem 2 is because it was discovered secondly. Photosystem 1 that we'll see here in a second was discovered first. And what these photosystems do is they absorb the sunlight, specifically the photons from sunlight, and that light energy, those photons, bounce around these different chlorophyll molecules until it gets to a particular, um, a particular chlorophyll, specifically P680. And when that happens, electrons that are held at this photosystem um, then are excited, and the excitement of those electrons pushes them to a higher energy level. You can see right here. And so once those, those electrons are at a higher energy level, they move through what we don't see in this image, but where this is occurring is the membrane of the thylakoid. And the thylakoid are the silver dollar or pancake-like um, stacks that are stacked together within the chloroplast. And so within the membrane of those thylakoids, there are a number of enzymes that these electrons move through. And this is in the process of an electron, electron transport chain that's very similar to what we saw in cellular respiration. And so the electrons move through the electron transport chain and through this process produce ATP um, in the same manner that it's produced during cellular respiration. Now you may, may be thinking, well, where do these electrons come from that are originally at this P680 pigment? Those electrons are produced, produced through a process called photolysis, And that is the splitting of water to produce hydrogen ions oxygen, and electrons. Four electrons get moved into the uh, photosystem here. The hydrogens then go into the lumen, or the internal part of the thylakoid. And then the O2, the oxygen, is released. And so water is necessar necessary in order to provide those electrons and then to provide the hydrogens that are used in the electron transfer chain. And I'm not going to go into the steps of this uh, right now, but we'll take a look at it here um, in a second of the electron transport chain. And so the electrons are moving through these different enzymes that make up the electron transport chain until they get to a second photosystem. And again, this is also within the thylakoid membrane. Additional light photons are absorbed at a different pigment of P700 this time. Again, those electrons are excited, and they again move through a second electron transport chain. And in this process, um, two NADPH are going to be produced. And this is similar to the NADH that we saw in cellular respiration. The NADPH and the ATP are going to be used in the Calvin cycle a little bit later in the light independent reactions in order to actually make sugar. Um, and so let's take a look at the step by step of what's happening in the light dependent reactions. Light strikes the pigment molecules in the photosystem two and it boosts those electrons to a higher energy level. This process continues until the electrons reach the P680 pigment, uh, followed by the primary electron acceptor. An enzyme catalyzes the splitting of water molecules, as we talked about, to release the hydrogen into the thylakoid lumen. O2 is released as a waste product, and then the electrons move through the electron transport chain. As previously mentioned, this electron transport chain is similar to that of what's occurring in the mitochondria, where the electrons provide energy for the synthesis of ATP by chemiosmosis, and then more light is absorbed by photosystem 2, which act activates the primary acceptor and then moves those electrons to a higher energy level. Electrons pass through a second electron transport chain, and lastly, an enzyme called NADP plus reductase reduces NAD plus to form NADPH, 
removing H plus from the stroma. So here's an image that kind of puts all of this together that we can see that's, that's nicely done. You can see here are the green stacks of thylakoids here, and so this is where this is taking place. This is the thylakoid space, the lumen. Uh, out here is the uh, stroma, or the white portion of our overall chloroplast image. And so here is the enzyme. Um, excuse me, here is the thylakoid. And so this photosystem 2, light is being absorbed, water is being split by photoliths, O2 is being released, those hydrogens collect within the thylakoid space, the lumen. Those electrons then move through these different enzymes, forcing additional hydrogens into the thylakoid space in the lumen. Additional light is absorbed in photosystem 1, continuing a second electron transport chain, NAD plus reductase, then produces NADPH and H plus hydrogen ions that go to the Calvin cycle. All of those hydrogen ions that get concentrated within the thylakoid lumen then move through ATP synthase to produce ATP. And so, again, this is an example of a metabolic pathway in which there's multiple steps of reactions here occurring to produce an end product, in this case NADPH and ATP, that will then be used to uh, produce sugars. I want to look at the term of photophosphorylation by chemiosmosis, and this is the movement of ions across a selectively permeable membrane. The splitting of hydrogen, uh, H2O, by light creates hydrogen ions. And the electron transport chains moves those ions across the membrane from areas of high concentration. And then they diffuse, uh, those hydrogen ions diffuse down the concentration gradient, moving from high to low. And as they do this, they move through ATP synthase, which then creates ATP from ADP uh, by using that ATP synthase enzyme. And that's very, very similar, essentially the same thing as what we saw in cellular respiration. And so a, a summary, overall summary of what we're seeing happening in the light-dependent reactions. Light energy is used to excite electrons. Photoliths of H2O produces hydrogen ions, electrons that are actually going to be used in the electron transport chain, and oxygen, O2, that is released as a waste product, thankfully for us. It then also produces ATP and NADPH, and those are going to be used in the light-independent reactions. And we'll look at the light-independent reactions in our, in our third and final video. Uh, to finish up this video, we want to look at a couple of other topics starting with Earth's atmosphere and photosynthesis. Photosynthetic prokaryotes first appeared on Earth about 3.5 billion years ago. We have this from the fossil record. And this was eventually followed by the great oxidation event. So the presence or the evolution of these photosynthetic prokaryotes began to pro produce oxygen within the atmosphere. This began about 2.4, 2.5 billion years ago, in which the oxygen levels increased to about 2% of the atmosphere. So the overall total atmosphere, about 2% of it was comprised of oxygen. And this occurred by about 2.2 billion years ago. This increase in oxygen caused an oxidation of dissolved iron in ocean water. And it caused it per to precipitate into the seabed. And that seabed then formed some specific rock layers that we can see iron banded formations. And you can see this in various rock layers uh, throughout the United States and throughout the world. Um, if you've ever been to Sedona in Arizona, you can see this in the rock layers. This red banded area is iron that's been oxidized. But the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere didn't stop at that point. And as the oxygen continued to increase more, and we saw an increase in diversity of different organisms on the planet, especially with the development of plants, the evolution of plants, and eventually there's an increase in uh, atmospheric oxygen to about 20% of the atmosphere, which is about what we see today, and that occurred about 750 to 630 million years ago. That is our conclusion for part two. Again, uh, in part three, we will discuss the light independent reactions and see what is being produced and how the sugars are actually created uh, using the ATP and the NADPH that's produced in light dependent reactions.